Brethren, it is my pleasure to introduce you to excellent companion Ian Currens, who many of you will perhaps know better as Grand Summus of the Ancient and Masonic Order of the Scarlet Cord. Ian began his Masonic journey in December 1977 and joined Abbey Lodge, Westminster, number 2030, where he was initiated, passed and raised. Ian comes from a long line of Freemasons. His late grandfather was also a member of the same lodge, having been initiated in 1927, and Ian was proposed by his father, making it three generations in the same lodge. Ian has achieved many accolades in masonry and is a very worshipful brother in the craft, as well as a past assistant Metropolitan Grand Master. He is also a past Grand Sword Bearer and a past assistant Metropolitan Grand Superintendent in the Holy Royal Arch, and is a member of no less than eight other orders administered out of Mark Mason's Hall. Ian dedicates much of his time to masonry and is always on hand to offer advice should a brother need it. Since his first appearance on Freemasons Without Borders in June last year, Ian has gone on to become a global internet and TV sensation, spreading his love and enjoyment of masonry throughout the world through a host of mediums. And we are very grateful that he agreed to come back to give us another talk. However, we are perhaps more grateful that his agent hasn't been in touch with us invoice in hand. Excellent companion in Currents, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, good evening. Good morning, good afternoon, brethren. Can I first say what a privilege it is to be invited back again to deliver a talk for Freemasons Without Borders? A special thanks to my good friend, Simon White, who suggested this talk, the Royal Arch Gateway to Other Orders, would be a good companion piece, excuse the pun, to his excellent talk about the Royal Arch itself last week. In effect, Simon has rescued this talk from the mortuary. It was originally commissioned by Metropolitan Grand Chapter in the early summer of last year. Written, recorded, sent off, but never broadcast. So its subtitle is The Talk Metropolitan Grand Chapter Didn't Want You to Hear. Not too long ago, the official description of the Royal Arch was that it was the completion of the third degree. Indeed, the 1989 ritual said, you may perhaps imagine that you have this day taken a fourth degree in Freemasonry. Such, however, is not the case. It is the Master Masons completed. We don't describe the Royal Arch in that way anymore because it gives the impression that the third degree is incomplete and that the Royal Arch is just an adjunct. Instead, we now describe chapter as completing the teachings of pure ancient masonry. The craft instructing us on our behavior with human beings and the Royal Arch inviting us to reflect on our relationship with the Supreme Being. But of course, this can give the impression that the Royal Arch is the terminus, the end of the line. Whereas in fact, in the case of several additional Masonic orders, it's the ticket barrier, if you like, the gateway. So today, I'm going to talk about four additional or progressive orders administered from Mark Mason's Hall in St. James's Street, London, for which membership of the Royal Arch is an essential qualification. I'm going to start with the Order of Royal and Select Masters, sometimes known as the Cryptic, which also has the mark as an entry requirement. The first thing I want you to do is to think of an historical timeline. This point here, which I'll call point A, marks the events of the third degree, the completion of King Solomon's temple and the death of its architect, Hiram Abiff, around 970 BC. This point here, which I shall call point B, is the discovery of the lost word in the vault under the old temple ruins by
by the sojourners, played out in the chapter Exaltation, around 530 BC. There's a big gap in time, of course, but an even bigger gap in our knowledge. The Royal Arch never actually tells us how the vault came to be there or why that's where we find the word. The first two of the cryptic's six degrees reveal all. As the temple is taking shape, the three grandmasters, Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and Hiram Abiff, realize that should the children of Israel at some time in the future deviate from God's laws, the city and temple would be sacked and the sacred treasures taken. The Royal and Select's degree of select master explains that in consequence, a secret vault is constructed right under the Holy of Holies. And replicas of the temple treasures and sacred writings are hidden in it. The next degree, Royal Master, relates the story of an industrious and gifted craftsman, Adoniram, who engineers an encounter with Hiram Abiff and inquires when he might receive the master word. Hiram, prophetically, and in a mesmerizing piece of ritual, explains that in the event of his death, the word will be deposited in the vault. So now we know. The cryptic's third degree, most excellent master, is concerned with the dedication of the temple once completed, while its fourth describes events in Jerusalem immediately after King Jehoiakim and his people, apart from those left to seal the land, are taken to Babylon. The Royal and Select's fifth degree, thrice illustrious master, takes us back to a time before the craft degrees. We learn how Solomon is chosen by King David to be the next king of Israel and entrusted with the task of constructing the temple. The final cryptic degree, excellent master, is very similar to the Scottish version of passing the veils. It is set in Babylon at the end of the 70 years captivity and explains how Israelites returning to Jerusalem to work on the second temple are entrusted with signs, words and tokens by which to prove themselves when they arrive. The final password they are given, of course, is the one we are required to supply before we are exalted into a chapter. So much for the order of Royal and Select Masters. The next order to which the Royal Arch and the Mark is a gateway is the order of the Allied Masonic Degrees. This is a group of five disparate degrees gathered together in 1879 to give them a central governing authority. After a few component changes over the years, the degrees now comprise St. Lawrence the Martyr, Knight of Constantinople, Grand Tylers of Solomon, Red Cross of Babylon, and Grand High Priest. St. Lawrence the Martyr relates the story of the Deacon Lawrence who was executed during the persecution of Christians in Rome by the Emperor Valerian in the third century BC. Understandably, the degree teaches fortitude. The degree of Knight of Constantinople is set in the courtyard of the palace of the Emperor Constantine the Great a century later. In it, we learn that Constantine is said to have abhorred the pride and arrogance of nobility, 
and instituted an order of knighthood, which he conferred upon the more common people. The lessons here are to hate arrogance and pride, to remember that he that exalteth himself shall be abased, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Holy Order of Grand High Priest is in two distinct parts and may indeed be an amalgamation of two earlier degrees. It has long been associated with the Royal Arch, for under the original Allied Constitutions, it could only be conferred on installed Royal Arch principles, not the case today. During a long and impressive ceremony, the candidate representing Abraham is received and blessed by Melchizedek, King of Salem, and the priest of the Most High God. Later, as the candidate is anointed, consecrated, and set apart to the holy office of Grand High Priest, there are references to Aaron, the first Jewish high priest. Thus, the candidate is left in no doubt that he is set apart for high responsibilities, and in order to carry them out, he should dedicate himself to the service of God and his fellow man. The degree of Grand Tylers of Solomon is similar to the cryptic degree of Select Master, in that it concerns the secret vault beneath the temple, but with interesting variations. Here, there is no suggestion of treasures or secrets being deposited in the vault. It is merely a place for the three Grand Masters to confer with their most skilled craftsmen as the building of the temple continues. An accidental intrusion and a consequential death sentence by King Solomon, later rescinded, warns of the perils of carelessness and hasty judgment. The fifth and last of the allied Masonic degrees to look at is the Red Cross of Babylon. This is particularly interesting to us as Royal Archmasons. The Jews are building the second temple at Jerusalem, but being harassed on all sides by neighboring tribes. Zerubbabel undertakes a journey back to Babylon to plead for protection from the new Persian king, Darius, a friend of his youth during the exile there. Darius agrees on the condition that Zerubbabel reveals the secrets of masonry, which distinguishes, which distinguishes the architects of the Jews from those of all other nations. Zerubbabel, of course, refuses, but Darius, appreciating his virtue, integrity and fidelity, grants his protection anyway. That completes our look at the five allied Masonic degrees. We now move on to two orders which are far removed from our craft and Royal Arch timeline in terms of their Masonic legends, but nevertheless have the Royal Arch as an entry requirement. The first one to look at is the Red Cross of Constantine. In the initial order of this rite, a candidate learns the story of Constantine the Great, the first Roman emperor to openly embrace and encourage Christianity. It is said Constantine converted to Christianity on the eve of the Battle of Milvian Bridge in AD 312, when he saw a cross in the sky with the inscription in this sign thou shalt conquer. In the ceremony, the candidate is admitted in the regalia of a royal archmason, and at the conclusion, this is replaced by the regalia of a perfect knight mason, and he is entrusted with a sword, 
an emblem of that spiritual warfare with sin. The Red Cross has two appendant orders, Knight of the Holy Sepulchre and Knight of St John the Evangelist. In the first of these, the candidate learns that sometime after his conversion to the Christian faith, Constantine sent his mother, St Helena, to the Holy Land in search of the true cross. She succeeded and St Helena and Constantine built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on the site. In the other appendant order, that of Knight of St John the Evangelist, the craft and royal arch legends are reinterpreted in a purely Christian sense. Nevertheless, these ceremonies do contain an essential message for all Freemasons of any faith that we no longer build real temples and tabernacles, but build them in our hearts. And finally, the Knights Templar, an order highly sought after, due in part to elaborate Crusader Knight regalia with much sword wielding. It's based on the original Templars, Knights who from the early years of the 12th century protected Christian pilgrims on their journey from the coast up to Jerusalem. In the Masonic order, the candidate is admitted as a pilgrim and must first figuratively perform a seven year pilgrimage. As a novice Templar, he must then undertake a figurative seven years of warfare, representing to us the constant warfare with the deceits of this world. A final representative year of penance precedes his installation and investiture as a Knight Templar, being enjoined to remain Christ's faithful soldier until death. The Appendant Order of Knight of St John tells the story of the Hospitallers from their foundation at Jerusalem to their virtual demise on Malta. It's interesting that KT has no Masonic legendary connection with the Royal Arch, yet chapter membership is a requirement. This is almost certainly because the earliest Templar ceremonies were often worked in Royal Arch chapters. Companions, that completes our brief look at four of the orders administered from Mark Mason's Hall that have the Royal Arch as a gateway. But before I close, let me just make two further observations. In less enlightened times, there was a fairly widespread view that membership of the additional or progressive orders somehow detracted from a Mason's commitment to the craft and Royal Arch. Happily, most of those dinosaurs are now extinct. Today's modern visionary Mason understands that those orders actually enrich your craft and Royal Arch experience by filling in the background of where they sit in an historical context and strengthening and embellishing the fundamental moral and spiritual lessons they teach. And for the sake of completeness, let me just point out that there are two significant MMH orders that don't have a Royal Arch requirement. The Mark degree, which leads on to the Royal Arch Mariner degree, and the order of the Secret Monitor, which leads on to the magnificent Scarlet Cord. But to misquote Mandy Rice Davis, I would say that, wouldn't I? If you want any further information, please get in touch with me on Facebook or Twitter. Thanks for listening. Ian, thank you very much.